Welcome to Trinity Central. We exist to make God central to our lives and our world. You are listening to a recording of one of our Sunday messages. For more information, please go to trinitycentral.org. It's amazing. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you for sharing so vulnerably and uh, honestly with us. Uh, we, such a powerful story, wasn't that? So good. You know, I think, I think we just need to be encouraged as a people that the more we share out of vulnerability, because I don't know about you, but just listening to... The first time I heard Dan tell that story, it just hit me. Just The more we tell our stories, uh, the more God uses our stories in the lives of others. And I, um, I believe God wants to set some of us free today. I believe there are people among us here today and, and God's saying, uh, I'm, today is an important day for you. I want to set you free. And the way he's going to do it is in the context of forgiveness. Uh, he loves you uh, and he wants to bring you th- through to a place of not only being forgiven, but extending forgiveness to others. And um, last week we heard another powerful story about forgiveness. We heard the story of Corrie ten Boom uh, forgiving her um, concentration camp guard. Um, as I came into my 20s, uh, I was, grew up in South Africa, and a story of forgiveness changed the shape of our nation. Uh, We were a nation coming out of apartheid and tottering on the edge of civil war. And uh, with all kinds of racial and tribal tension. And, you know, God gave us a man of forgiveness. And he stepped out of a prison cell uh, that he'd been in for 27 years. And his name was Nelson Mandela. And, and he, he came into authority as a, as a president of a country. And he shared actually with um, Bill Clinton did an interview with him one day. And Clinton said to him, were you not angry? He said, yeah, for 12 years in that prison, I raged in my heart. And then he said, I realized that I was giving my heart I was giving my heart to what was happening to me, to what was being done to me, to the injustice. And I chose to forgive. And that man led a country through the place of forgiveness. And the power of his forgiveness changed the course of a nation. And and so today we're talking about the course of our own lives. Dan has just shared how his own life changed when he forgave, but he's also shared how the lives of his children and his grandchildren have changed because of his forgiveness, that freedom has come not just to him personally, but to his whole household. And as we step into forgiving others, we release freedom, not only in our own lives, we step into the freedom that God has for us, but we release freedom into the situations that we're part of, into our families, into other places. And so uh, we're going to be talking about forgiveness today. And particularly, I want to zone in today on how do we forgive. That's where we're going. That's that's our destination point. Um, But I just want to, uh, I want to talk, I want to remind us about why we forgive. I want to talk about how we forgive. And then what I want to do is I want to, essentially lead us through forgiveness. I want to workshop this morning. If, if, I was, if I was sitting with you in a room and you were saying, I know God has told me that I need to forgive somebody, the process that we would walk through, I want to do that with us this morning uh, to give us the opportunity where uh, those of us who might be carrying unforgiveness, um, where, where you might come this morning into a place of forgiveness and freedom. And uh, I wonder whether I could just start off by asking us all to stand for a moment. 
And if you're at home and you're on the stream, I'd encourage you just to stand. And I'd encourage you just to open your, eye, uh, open your hands and close your eyes and just to say to the Holy Spirit, I'm available to you this morning. Would you speak to me today? Would you show me any unforgiveness in my heart? And would you empower me this morning to walk in forgiveness? In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. You may be seated. So just, just for a moment, briefly, I want to do... Uh, I want to remind us where we are. <laughs> so in uh, the fall last year, we began a series called Alive in Christ. And we've been talking about the foundations of our Christian life. And we've talked about three words that describe uh, our salvation. We talked about justification, that the moment we put our trust in Jesus, we are made righteous, we are saved. But that reality, that spiritual reality, now needs to become a reality which works out through our lives day by day. And we call that process sanctification. The Holy Spirit is working out salvation in us. We are becoming righteous in that sense. We are righteous in our justification. We are becoming righteous. The Holy Spirit is working that out in us. And ultimately, there is a moment, and we've been singing about it in, in worship and speaking about it in worship. There is a moment where Jesus Christ will return and He will take us to be with Him in glory and we will be glorified. We will be saved. We will be utterly righteous. We will be like Him. We will reflect His glory in the most magnificent way. Our lives at that point will be utterly uh, uh, free, the, the, the fullness of everything that God has promised to us will be fully realized in our lives in that moment. And that is where God is taking. And that is the eternal hope that exists in our hearts. That's what we're, we're living towards. We know it's, it's like an inheritance that's coming to us. It's guaranteed. It's already ours. We're not living in the fullness of it yet, but it's ours. And so this is where salvation is taking us. This is where God is taking us through Jesus Christ. He has justified us. If we, and let me just say, if we have trusted in Jesus, He has justified us. If we are trusting in Jesus, He is sanctifying us. And in that moment when we see Him in His glory, we will be like Him. We will be glorified ourselves. And so what we're focusing on this series, uh, Alive in Christ, we're focusing on this, partic this, this sec uh, middle section of sanctification. How do we change? How do we grow to be like Jesus? How does righteousness work out in our lives? And how are we increasingly becoming like Jesus? That's what we've been focusing on. And we've talked about this uh, reality of... Um, that, that as we come to faith in Jesus and as we grow in Jesus, we need to unpack some of the stuff of the past. Some of the stuff, uh, and we've used the analogy of a suitcase. If you go on a journey, uh, you come back from that journey and your suitcase is full of dirty clothes. Uh, and it's, it's a bit like that when we come to faith in Jesus, uh, our suitcase is full of dirty clothes. And what we need to do is we need to unpack those clothes uh, and put them in the washing machine so that we can pack the suitcase with new clean clothes ready to go on our next journey. And so we talked about that as an analogy. And so what we're walking through at the moment is different elements of unpacking the suitcase of our past, the suitcase of our lives, so that we can walk in freedom and in a way that makes us look like Jesus. So we started talking about our identity. Uh, I'm just going to skip over this very quickly. We talked about identity and how our identity needs needs to be foundationed in Christ and not in our, uh, our relationships or not in our performance or any, anything else. It needs to be foundationed in the love of God. And we talked about how repentance, the lifestyle of a Christian is a lifestyle of repentance where we are continually dealing with the sin in our lives and bringing it to the Lord and saying, please, would you forgive me? We talked about repentance. We talked about family sin patterns, about how there are things that 
tend to pass from generation to generation in our families that we need to uh, look full in the face and say, I, I'm not going to walk in this anymore. I'm going to make this a matter of discipleship. And we begin to, be, we begin to break free from the past, which is in our families. And then last week, uh, James began to talk about forgiveness, and he talked primarily about why we forgive. He talked about the forgiveness that God gives us and the ability that we can forgive because of what God has done in our lives. Now, in my pastoring of people, there are three things that I have seen that are blockages to people receiving God's love, experiencing His presence, and experiencing the favor of God in our lives. There are three things that I would say are common, that when people are saying, I'm struggling to hear God, I'm struggling to receive from God, I'm struggling to feel His presence, I don't feel loved by God, these three things are the things that I first would go to in asking the question, how do we help you? Number one, a refusal to repent. Uh, when I choose not to own sin, not to be real and vulnerable about it and to bring it into the light, that thing becomes a blockage in my relationship with God. I begin to struggle to feel His love and His grace and His compassion. I struggle to engage with His presence. I don't feel the reality of His favor in my life. So a refusal to repent, number one. Number two, not receiving forgiveness. See, when we come and we put our trust in Jesus... And we say, Lord, would you forgive me? He does. Scripture tells us that he's faithful and just to forgive us all our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in that moment, God forgives you and says, I am now canceling this debt against you. I'm setting you free in that sense. I'm, I'm releasing you from culpability of that sin. I'm forgiving you. But in part of, that, part of that process for us is receiving His forgiveness. And one of the things that I notice is that sometimes we can get into a place where we don't receive His forgiveness in a, in a real way. And actually, I would say one of the important things that as believers we need to do continually is thank God for His forgiveness. We need to sing songs about, you've forgiven me. We've done that this morning. I came out of the tomb. I came out of the grave with you. Out of my sin and my shame, you've forgiven me. You set me free. We need to sing songs about that. And sometimes I've heard Christians say things like, oh, I know all that stuff. Yeah, but if you know it and you're not feeling it, if you're not engaging with it, if you're not living in the good of it, it's not helping you. It's not serving you. We need to receive the forgiveness of God. For some of us, sometimes we need to forgive ourselves. There's been uh, something that we've done and what we're actually doing, we've, we've said to God maybe a hundred times, please forgive me, please forgive me, please forgive me. But what we're doing is we're continually dredging that thing out of the past and saying, but I'm still guilty, but I'm still guilty, but I'm still... And God says, no, you're not. You're not condemned. You're no longer culpable. I have set you free from that. I have forgiven you. I have paid the debt myself. And that's what the gospel says. So that's the, the second thing is not receiving forgiveness. The third thing is holding forgive, un unforgiveness against others or towards others. When we refuse to forgive others, we begin to screw shut the tap of God's forgiveness in our lives. And we talked about this last week, so I'm not going to go back over that ground. But the reality is that our forgiving of others is, a, is deeply connected to God's forgiving of us and our walking in His grace and our experience of God's love and favor in our lives. When we do not forgive others, and as, as Dan said it this morning, what begins to happen is bitterness begins to grow in our lives. And it's like, it is, it is a spiritual cancer. 
It begins to kill us from the inside out. And we find that our, our lives increasingly, bit by bit by bit, unseen, but we are dying. Our relationship with God is dying on the inside. Now, just to say, if you have not listened to James's message from last week, I would highly recommend that message to you. I would encourage you to go and listen to it this week and process it. Okay, what is forgiveness? What is forgiveness? Repentance is the process of owning my own culpability and responsibility for the things I have done to God and to others. Forgiveness is releasing others from the culpability and responsibility of the things they have done to God and to me. Okay, so forgiveness is a conscious, deliberate decision to release them and to release our feelings of resentment, any desire for vengeance or retribution or continued accountability towards that person or group who has harmed us, regardless of whether they actually deserve our forgiveness or have asked for it. That's what forgiveness is. So we talked about why do we forgive last week? And just to skim over that again, because it's so important that this is uh, central in our thinking. Ephesians 1, no, number 1, why do we forgive? Number 1, God has forgiven us. Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, In Jesus we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, our sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished on us. The, the heart of God towards you and me is so generous and so gracious. When he comes to forgive us, there's no begrudging in his, in his forgiveness towards us. There is this massive heartedness, this generosity of heart to, uh, that he comes to us and he says, I remember your sins against you no more. You are free. You are forgiven. I love to forgive you. That's the Father's heart. Ephesians 4 verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So we forgive because God has forgiven us. And in the same way that God has forgiven us, we in turn begin to move towards others with forgiveness. So that forgiveness that God has flowed into, into our lives, lavishing us with grace, extending such richness to us, we begin to pour that same thing out into the lives of others, those who have hurt us. So God has forgiven us and we have received something. Number one, that's why we forgive. Number two, God commands us to forgive. And Jesus gives us some pretty hard and uncompromising teaching when it comes to this. He said, and we, we, we talked about this last week, if you do not forgive, I will not forgive you. If you do not forgive, I will not forgive you. But Jesus doesn't only teach forgiveness. And, and this is what I think is so important for us. Jesus doesn't just command us to forgive. Jesus models forgiveness for us. Jesus starts the process of forgiving. He doesn't say forgive and then I'll forgive. He, he starts the process. He initiates it first. And then he says, now out of this, out of what I have done, you forgive. Jesus, Luke 23 verse 34, hanging on a cross, Jesus looks at those around him, looks through the mist of time to you and to me, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And while he was doing it, it says, and they cast lots to divide his garments. The, the brutality and the cruelty of the moment is so palpable in the scripture as we're reading it. And yet the cry of Jesus' heart is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Wow, what an incredible savior we serve. And so when Jesus gives himself uh, in that way to those who mistreat him and he says, 
I forgive them, what he's saying to us is forgiveness is not only necessary, it is not only critical, it is possible. It is possible. And, no ma- and the truth is, friends, uh, there are all kinds of things that have happened to the people in this room. Things some I know about and many I don't know about. Where you have been hurt or damaged by somebody else. And the gospel says to you, it is possi- possible to forgive. I will give you grace to forgive. That's God's heart towards us. The Holy Spirit will give us power. Mark 11, verse 25, And when you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive your trespasses. So we cannot be free until we're forgiven. And that's our third reason. We cannot be free until we have been forgiven. We need to be set free from something. Mandela had discovered the secret. He had discovered, I can't be free if I stay in this place of rage and anger and hatred. I'm the one who's in slavery. And that's what the gospel says to us. Now, I want to tell you just a little bit about my own story for a moment. Um, My father had an affair when I was nine years old and left us. And uh, at the age of 13, my parents divorced. And in the midst of all of that, God was very good to me. And God spoke to me about his father heart. And I, all through the years, uh, all through my teenage years, I had this awareness of the father heart of God. But at the same time, all through my teenage years, I lived with this uh, deep sense of pain Uh, about my dad leaving us, and a a very deep sense of shame as well that my father had left us, that there was something in my father's leaving of us that that was, uh, that maybe I had a sense of responsibility in, or uh, I don't know necessarily how I would express it, but I felt shame. And throughout all of my teenage years, I never told anyone that my dad had left us. So when my friends asked, where's your dad? Um, I, I, I would always tell them the truth. He's in Cape Town. He's on a business trip. He's here. He's there. I just would never tell them the whole truth. He's left. I couldn't bring myself to do that. I couldn't. I, I don't know whether it was that by saying it, I would accept it to be true. I would validate that it was uh, true, or, or even that I would in somehow uh, validate that it wasn't the wrong thing, that it, was, that it was somehow okay. But I could not, I could not own it. I could not own the truth to others. And I found myself in this, in this kind of tension where I loved my dad but I was becoming angrier and more bitter towards him as my teenage years went on. And I came to a point where I guess it must have been my early 20s, 2021, where God began to speak to me through messages uh, that I was hearing people preaching through my own conviction. Increasingly, I was no, I, I began to know I have to deal with this. I have to deal with this. On one hand, I have to deal this, with this because it's going to kill me. On another hand, I have to deal with this because I know God's putting his finger on it. And so eventually I sat down and I wrote to my dad. I probably rewrote that letter five or six times till the point where I felt like I could actually express um, both the sense of pain that I felt and uh, the genuine sense of I am choosing to forgive you um, for what has happened to me, what you've done. And uh, I remember posting the letter to him at the time he lived in Johannesburg. I lived in Pietermaritzburg. And 
I remember as I posted the letter, the sense of peace uh, descended on me. It was, uh, it was something tangible. It was, like, it was like this burning thing that had been with me all the time was gone, just gone. Was peace was where that anger and bitterness, the, uh, it's like a twistedness in my soul. It's like this knot. It's just was gone. My dad rang me um, a couple of days later. I guess he'd got the, well, he had got the letter. And all he said to me at the time was, I received your letter. Thank you, my boy. Didn't say anything else. But somehow in that moment, there was a, 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 de a depth of restoration in our relationship uh, that continues to this day. Now, it was interesting. This week something happened, and I'm not going to go into it, but something happened this week that made me realize that there was an element, uh, there was an aspect of something in my relationship with my dad which I, I guess I hadn't fully comprehended or dealt with. Or, um, um, and it was like, as I was, I was talking with Sarah about something, and it was in the conversation, and, and I'm, I guess I'm a bit of an external processor, so maybe this was part of it. As I was talking with her, I said something, and I thought, wow, I am living like a 13-year-old with regard to that particular thing. I'm still living there. And it was like this just realization um, that I need, to, I, I need to step back into owning that, forgiving. And so I did. And uh, um, forgive me for being cryptic in that. I just don't really want to expose uh, him in that sense. But I, I just found that God touched me where over years I had continued this line of thinking and needed to be broken. And the moment I saw it, the mo I, I said, Jesus, I forgive. Jesus, I'm sorry. Felt freedom from that. God wants to do that for people here this morning. He wants to free you. Um, maybe that even while I'm speaking, you're, you're, there's somebody who's coming to mind. Maybe that even while I'm speaking, you're feeling, uh, you're seeing a face. There's some sense of the Holy Spirit putting a name in your heart. You know, oh gosh, I need to forgive that person. There's unfinished business there. You know, there are two internal objections that I think we face when it comes to forgiveness. The first Objection is, if I forgive and I'm releasing this person from culpability, I feel like I'm saying, what you did to me doesn't matter. What you did to me doesn't matter. When I forgive you, it's like, I, I, I do that. I, I say, you're off the hook. It doesn't matter. It wasn't so bad. But that's not true. We're not saying that. We're not saying it doesn't matter. What we're saying is what you did really did matter. It caused damage. Hurt me. But I'm releasing you to God. And no longer am I holding you accountable personally to me for that thing you did. I'm releasing you to God. I'm trusting God for justice. The second thing that is an objection for us often is that when 
we hold unforgiveness towards someone in our hearts, what begins to happen is we, we begin to reduce them to the thing they've done to us. We don't see them really as human anymore. We don't see them as who they are. We just see them as that thing they've done. And it's like if somebody challenges you and says, you did this thing and it hurt me. You hold up your hands and you say, guilty, but, I, but I'm complicated. You know, I, I do good things and, and yes, I'm sorry, I did that bad thing as well. We have this way of seeing ourselves very relatively, but often when we when we're hurt by others, that, relative, that, that sense of looking with judgment or with balance disappears and we begin to see them only. We reduce them. They, they become subhuman to us in some sense. They become simply the thing they have done to us. And when we withhold forgiveness... It can also it can and almost have the sense of um, I'm I'm holding on to control here. I'm the, I'm the person in control by holding you accountable. I'm the person in control. But actually, the truth is, what's happening is that we are being controlled. We're being controlled by our anger. We're being controlled by our bitterness. We're, we are subject to what is happening. And so we're not really holding them accountable. We're actually holding ourselves in slavery. And when we come to forgiveness, we relinquish that sense of control and we find that we are no longer controlled. We are no longer slaves. We are set free from that. We begin to leave it in God's hands. And this is what is so key, is, is that we recognize that God is a just God. And that God's justice is going to be worked out. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4 says, The rock, this is what it calls God, the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness. And without iniquity, just and upright is he. So if I forgive and I release them, how will there be justice? I don't want to forgive. I want justice, we cry out. But actually what happens is we forgive and we entrust them to God. And God is the one who will bring justice to all. God is the one to whom every man and every woman is ultimately responsible. And Romans 11 verse 33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Can you imagine untangling the ball of injustice through every century, through every family, through every situation, through every individual, through every nation, for all of time, he can. How unsearchable your judgments. And so when we, when we come to a place of saying, God, you get to judge, we can trust that the true judge will bring justice in the end. How unsearchable your judgments. So we're going to come and we're going to just pray in a moment. I want to just say that we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, God himself, wants to empower us to forgive. He wants to come near to you and to me and say, hey, I've got power for you to forgive. Some of us need to understand there's a decision that needs to be made. I'm, I'm choosing to forgive. Forgiveness is a choice. But it's not a choice we have to make on our own. We can say, God, would you help me? 
And so the Holy Spirit wants to draw near to us and help us. How do we forgive? Five-step process. Number one, we recognize. We recognize we're holding unforgiveness. We recognize that in our own hearts, we're trying to hold someone accountable for what they've done to us. Number two, we release. We engage with God about how we feel about it. And we release the emotion to Him. We begin to give it over to Him. And then we repent and forgive. Why do I say repent and forgive? Because when we hold unforgiveness, we need to understand that sin. And so we, we come to God and we say, forgive me for withholding repent, uh, forgiveness. I repent of that. And now I choose to forgive. And, and we make that decision before the Lord to forgive that person. Then we renounce, number four. There are lies that come into our lives as we hold un people in unforgiveness. Those things begin to dominate us. We need to cut them off. So for some of us, maybe uh, something has happened to us and out of that thing that's happened to us, we begin to think about ourselves in a particular way. We've begun to in one sense, partner with that truth. We begin to own that truth about ourselves. And so we begin to renounce that. We say, no, no, what God says about me is true of me. What God says about me is what I'm going to choose to believe and to live in. And then finally, we replace it. The space left, in, left by those lies, by the unforgiveness, we begin to speak truth into it. I'm loved. They're loved. We begin to bless. We begin to, uh, to understand what Jesus meant by love your enemies. <laughs> we begin to say, I bless you in Jesus. I'm so free. Even though you've harmed me, I can bless you. Now, that may seem a long way from where you're at right now, but you can get there. You can walk through this process. And so what I'd love to do is just going to do this quietly. Um, I'm going to encourage you in just a moment to stand up. And I'm going to lead you through this process. It may, not, it may be that you have no outstanding accounts with others. That may be the case for you. But for many of us, I suspect there are outstanding accounts. And this morning... God wants to set you free, and uh, it's going to be your decision. <laughs> it's going to be your decision to forgive. But this morning, I feel like there's an opportunity that God's offering, where it's like, you can step into this this morning. You can come into freedom this morning. I'm offering you a moment where you can process this. So I'm going to get us to stand in a moment, and I'm going to take us through this. And then at the end... What I'd love to do is just offer for us to pray for anyone. So as, as you, if you felt like something significant was happening for you, we'd love to pray. We'd love to bless you in that. Is that okay? Yeah. Why don't we stand? Why don't we stand? So as you stand, I want you just to close your eyes. This is not about you and me. This is about you and your Father, your Heavenly Father. So why don't you just say, Holy Spirit, would you just show me if there's anyone that I need to forgive? And if somebody is coming to mind. Maybe somebody's been in your mind all the way through this message. Just hold that for a moment. 
Holy Spirit, would you just come and speak? Would you give revelation across this room right now? Thank you, Jesus. Now, what I want you to do is, or what I want to encourage you to do, is to release. To engage with how you feel about it. How do I feel? How do I feel about this thing? Be honest in this moment. Maybe carrying emotion that is a result of this issue or memory. You, you may be still feeling that sense of hurt. Just express that to God. Just in this moment, being honest with God is really important. Tell, tell Him the whole thing. For some of us in this moment, we actually also need to acknowledge, I felt let down by you, God. Maybe you felt unprotected in some way. Just express that to God. This is what I felt and why I felt it. Now, what I want to encourage you to do now is to make a choice. Okay, and the choice can start simply like this. Lord Jesus, because you have forgiven me, and by the Holy Spirit's power, I choose to forgive so and so. Okay, so name them. And what I would encourage you to do is then say, I choose to forgive them of and name what it is that they did. I'm actually just going to lead us aloud in prayer. So if this is you, if you want to pray, I'm, I'm going to pray out loud and just invite you to pray with me. Father, I choose to forgive so and so. I choose to forgive them. I hold, uh, I, I release accountability. I no longer hold them. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, I ask you now that you would help me that the decision I have made would increasingly become the truth of my emotional state and that I might walk in freedom from this situation. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now, if there's anything that the, what has happened to you has begun to build up as a, an identity lie, or um, so, for example, let me give a, an example like this, uh, a child who feels like they were abandoned or um, that they, they, do not, they did not have a voice uh, to their parents while they were growing up, they may uh, continue to carry the, the lie of I don't matter. What I say doesn't matter. Okay, and so there are things that we can then begin to live with out of that which has happened to us. And I just want to encourage you now to ask the Holy Spirit, would you show me if there are any lies that I am living out of from that situation? Just take a moment and 
Just see if there's anything that comes to rest for you. You feel like the Holy Spirit brings something to mind. And so now what we do is we renounce that. We simply say, in the name of Jesus, I renounce that lie. I refuse to have that as part of my identity. I'm loved. I'm chosen. God's my father. I'm wanted. I'm precious in his sight. You renounce that lie. And then finally, you replace what has been spoken or what you've taken on. You begin to bless. So just in your heart, you say, Holy Spirit, I choose to believe the truth about myself. And I choose to begin to step into what it means to be an overcomer in this area. I choose to bless so-and-so in you. I ask you for your good to happen in their lives. I ask you that you would bring them to repentance. I ask you that you would show yourself to them. I ask you that you would show mercy to them. I ask you that you would bring them to a saving knowledge of you. I ask you that you would meet their needs. You just begin to pray for them. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Father, I just want to pray for every single person who in these moments has been uh, dealing with or grappling with something very specific in this area. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, now for your presence to come on them. <coughs> I ask you, Lord Jesus, for a, your freedom just to well up. I, I pray, Father, for the knowledge of what it means to be set free uh, living in that new creation reality that you have for us, uh, stepping into all that you have. I pray, Father, for an impartation of joy. I pray, Father, for an impartation of faith. I, I pray, Father, where these things hold us back uh, from stepping into the purposes of God. I ask you, Father, for a sense of release now to begin to engage with and to own and to press into all that God has. Uh, I pray, Father, for things that have been spoken over to be broken now in the name of Jesus. I pray for lies that people have lived in to be broken now in the name of Jesus. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would come and that you would bring healing and peace I thank you for that, that balm of Gilead, that ointment to our soul, uh, that the Holy Spirit, as I ask you, that you'd just come on us now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, it may be that as I took us through this process, you felt... Yeah, there is really something that I need to deal with. And this process is, in one sense, way too fast uh, for what I need. I need more time. I need to process this at a deeper level. And uh, we would just invite you to, to do that with someone. Uh, I want to encourage you to do that with someone. It really helps uh, to have someone to reflect with, somebody who's got maturity in Jesus. Um, and so don't, don't, don't leave without dealing with stuff. I don't mean that you have to deal with it right now. I just mean that make a decision now. I'm going to get hold of so-and-so and I'm going to walk this through because I need to get, to get free of it. Uh, I, I, I believe that, that even actually for some right now, even as you've just engaged with this, there's something that's happening in you and uh, God is going to, you're going to really live in the good of that over these coming days. You're going to experience that. Uh, so, hallelujah. It's so good. It's so good. If you would like prayer, 
come on down to the front. We're going to dismiss everyone now. We're going to go and have a cup of coffee and go and, uh, yes, uh, go and grab your kids first and then uh, have a, uh, a cup of coffee. If you would like to be prayed for by someone, if, the, if you know stuff was happening in my heart, God's putting his finger on something, why don't you come and get prayed for? We'd love to pray for you. Uh, if you do, say again. Yes, if you do uh, want to get prayed for, please uh, ask someone to go and collect your kids for you so that we don't leave the kids team uh, waiting uh, endlessly for, for, for you. Okay, wonderful. The Lord bless you, church. The Lord bless you with freedom. Go have a, a, a wonderful coffee and a great week, and uh, we will see you in a week's time.